Hi, I'm Richard Hall. I'm a documentary filmmaker. And um, I was recently out at the National Archives looking for some films related to the New York Herald Tribune uh, World Youth Forum program that lasted from the mid 1940s to the early 1970s. I'm working with a, um, a historian in Australia on a short documentary about this program called The World We Wanted. If you want to know more about that documentary, watch the film I'm, I'm about to show you all the way through to the end and you can click, you can see a um, trailer for The World We Wanted. But this film is a 1949 U.S. Army film called Operation Columbus, and it profiles a group of students who came from all around the world to New York City for the New York Herald Tribune's program. And this was uh, an army film, so it's in the public domain. It's rights free. It belongs to the American people. But uh, it was quite an amazing Cold War program to try to uh, help sell America, uh, bring people from around the world, not not from communist countries, but from our uh, allies mostly. Also countries that were on the fence or perceived to be on the fence that we're trying to convince to be on our side during the Cold War. Um, so anyway, this is a 14 minute film called Operation Columbus. Enjoy it. And if you like this film, please check out all the other films on our YouTube channel, Nerds Make Media. Um, subscribe to our channel. Tell your friends about it. There's a lot of things on here. There's documentaries, uh, hist history documentaries, clips about the Constitution, about the history of liberalism, conservatism, uh, old home movies that I've done over the years, all sorts of things. There's something there for everybody. So Operation Columbus, here you go. <laughs> Thirty-four young ambassadors arrived at LaGuardia Field from 17 European nations. Jenny and Gus from Holland. Ferdinanda from Austria and John from Great Britain. Hanna from Denmark. Student delegates to the 1949 New York Herald Tribune Forum for High Schools, brought as guest passengers of U.S. Airlines. They earned the right to represent their countries on the basis of nationwide competition. This American newspaper, with the New York Board of Education and Metropolitan School Study Council, sponsored their 10-week visit, culminating with the forum. 10 weeks of getting a close look at our educational, industrial, and cultural life. 10 weeks as guests in the homes of high school students. Here was their first meeting with American boys and girls their own age, their hosts and hostesses. Some, like Elfrida of Frankfurt, had never been away from home. We liked them, and they liked us. In New York, the world's largest city, they were fascinated by the skyscrapers. Terrified by the traffic. Marveled at our parks and the Statue of Liberty. They went to school with their hosts in and around New York. They had a chance to see what schools were like in Brooklyn, Westchester, Long Island, New Jersey. At the Music and Art School, they attended a class in music and listened to a lecture by Leonard Rose, celebrated cellist of the New York Philharmonic. The 34 delegates, split up into small groups, were getting a good cross-section of our high schools. Einar Benedictson of Iceland had this to say. What impressed me first was the freedom in American high schools. Students are certainly offered a great variety of courses. Marco Bacciagolupi of Italy was enthralled with the machine shops. They must have cost a terrific amount of money to the Board of Education. First class equipment too. I was amazed. 
Yali Ergenkun of Turkey observed that we only took half as many subjects as she did and that we didn't go to school on Saturdays. Solvi Boji of Norway liked the informal relationship between teacher and pupils here. Rosemary Nugent of Ireland was interested in our student government because it made the pupil seem responsible for the school. We received credit for athletics. They didn't. And so it went. From Mitchell Field one chilly morning, they took off in C-47s for a countrywide tour of the United States. The Christopher Columbus Club, that's what they called themselves. They were discovering America. Dick Leather of Long Island and Helen Janandes of Brooklyn were seeing America for the first time too. That's Dick with Rosemary of Dublin. Gabriella of Italy was getting herself a bird's eye view. Colonel Nancy Teer of the Civil Air Patrol answered questions. Their route was south to Nashville, Tennessee, southwest to Dallas, Texas, and Phoenix, Arizona. They were given a big day in Dallas and learned about hospitality, Texas style. They were introduced to the art of duck pin bowling and found the pins weren't easy to knock down. Shooting pool required a certain amount of skill. Elfrida from Frankfurt am Main tried her hand at it. Because of bad weather, they were late in arriving in Phoenix. The runways were awash and it was cold. They scrambled out of the C-47s and received a hearty welcome. A local radio announcer interviewed Ferdinanda of Vienna, who was always a willing subject, as were the others. They were quite naturally interested in our planes and swarmed over the jets like kids in a candy store. This was unofficial entertainment and at the students' request, the pilots gave them a thrilling demonstration. A few of the students had cameras with them and photographed some of our speed demons. The jets whizzed over Sky Harbor Airport. Next, an official welcome was waiting for them at Camelback Villa by Governor Dan Garvey of Arizona. They were then treated to a firelight barbecue dinner. In California, they finally saw sunshine, and by noon, everyone had been to school. Hank Miller, Voice of America broadcaster, met our two Greek students in the library of Los Angeles High School. Zoe said she loved to read and wished she had as many books in her own school. Tony liked the way California students were looking out for the other fellow. A luncheon and reception by Mayor Fletcher Bowron of Los Angeles was next on the agenda. At the Biltmore Hotel, the Foreign Trade Association of Southern California and the World Trade Committee of the Chamber of Commerce had arranged for each of the European students to sit beside the consuls of their respective countries. Ferdinanda of Austria thanked them all for herself and her friends. John and Anne of Great Britain, Louise and Roger of Belgium, Jenny and Gus of Holland, Jacqueline and Jean-Claude of France, Lena and Espjorn of Sweden, Hanna and Torsten of Denmark, Mady and Jean of Luxembourg, Verena and Peter of Switzerland. In Hollywood, they discovered all was not grease paint and glamour, but hard work like any other job. When they left Lockheed Airport, Colorado bound, they were a happy group, with Mady of Luxembourg still starry-eyed over Cornell Wilde. The Christopher Columbus Club was on the return leg of its discovery of America. They were on their way to Denver, and below them lay some of the most magnificent scenery on the American continent. Boulder Dam, standing 700 feet high astride the Colorado River. Lake Mead, thrusting its thousand fingers into the surrounding hills and canyons. They flew eastward along the Colorado into the Grand Canyon country. Everyone crowded to the windows to watch the river gorge widen into that tremendous cut. 
In Denver, they were welcomed by the students of South High School and entertained by them at Evergreen Lodge. Yali and Fuad of Turkey sang for the throng. All stayed at the homes of local high school students. Maria of Portugal was a guest of the Shavers. Like her fellow delegates, she always found it difficult to leave the many friends she had made throughout the United States. In Detroit, Michigan, they went to the Ford plant to see the assembly line in action. They saw the assembly line running from building to building, car bodies being painted and dried simultaneously, men assembling the chassis all in two hours. They couldn't believe their eyes. They visited the Ford Trade School, where boys interested in manufacturing work earned while they learned. After lunch, they went to the Edison Museum, Henry Ford's memorial to his old friend. The highlight of their tour was a visit to Washington. They took in the world famous points of interest, met senators, congressmen, cabinet members, and finally, the hardest working man in the Capitol, Harry S. Truman, President of the United States. They were amazed at the informality and warmth of his greeting. He spoke briefly of America's form of government, the United Nations, and keeping the peace, which we all want. After two weeks and 7,000 miles, they were back in New York. At Lake Success, they met Trigva Lee, Secretary General of the United Nations. They discussed with him their plans for an international youth association. Finally, the big event took place on March 5th in the Grand Ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, the fourth annual New York Herald Tribune Forum for High Schools. The 34 foreign delegates and Americans discussed and debated international problems. A capacity audience of 2,000 American high school students, teachers, school officials and educators were present. Paul G. Hoffman, ECA administrator, was one of the distinguished speakers. He spoke simply and directly of the Marshall Plan's progress in helping to bring about economic recovery in Europe. Here, the man who was supervising an expenditure of $570,000 an hour lauded the countries for their self-denial and achievement. Student delegates reported their country's needs and what was being done with Marshall Plan aid. Elfrida Kopp described the program as mutual cooperation between nations and self-help to the limit of each country's ability. How well this cooperation was working was shown in the case of her own Germany. The United States provided food, which enabled Germans to work. Now other countries could supply Germany with more food in exchange for coal. Luxembourg was sixth in world production of steel. Greece was able to have an extra page in her newspapers, thanks to Swedish wood pulp. Austria's contribution would be in electricity when her proposed power plants had been completed. Ireland had concluded a four-year trade agreement with England, sending her butter, meat and eggs in return for coal, steel and other essentials. Some of the foreign delegates fired questions at ECA Chief Hoffman. He answered these questions straightforwardly to the best of his ability. Another distinguished speaker, Sir Oliver Franks, British ambassador to the United States, gave a detailed account of Britain's progress in the recovery program. He struck the theme that recovery would lead to even greater unity among all nations. He discussed with the students the possibilities of alliances, commerce and federation. The Atlantic Pact would make for peace 
a freer flow of commerce between Eastern agricultural and Western industrial Europe. He did not know whether present alliances would ultimately lead to a Western European Federation. More panel discussions followed on school and home life. In a few days, they left for home for 17 different nations of the European Recovery Program. They would soon be thousands of miles from the United States, many miles from each other, but always together, working for everlasting peace. This can best be expressed by the students themselves who said, why indeed should not world government be the ultimate achievement of mankind? We want freedom with absolute justice and equality of human rights. We want security of that freedom. And we want peace, because without peace, none of these things is possible.